Here we go. <laughs> Welcome everybody to um, our, our webinar on Brexit and IP, um, what you need to know now. I'm going to um, introduce myself and my co-presenter uh, in a moment, but for right now, I just wanted to really quickly let everybody know that we're hoping to have time at the end. We expect this to be around 30 minutes, but we're also hoping to have time at the end for questions. And I'm told, and I'm sure everybody is now getting accustomed to these uh, virtual webinars that there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'd be happy to entertain uh, your questions, which we will either sort of field as we go, if that makes sense, or we'll do it at the end. But feel free in any event to go ahead uh, and familiarize yourself with that feature and please do send us um, your questions. The other thing I would say is um, I understand you will be getting a, a copy of the slides after the presentation, so don't feel like you have to take notes, uh, we will circulate the slides to everybody who attends um, after the presentation. So welcome everybody. Um, next slide, if you will. Um, this is where, this is sort of that usual disclaimer that law firms always have to make about ensuring that you, everybody understands that this is not specific legal advice. In fact, we'll, we'll just be giving a very high level overview um, I do know so many of the attendees today are our clients already, but in any event, you should definitely consult with a lawyer um, about specifics of your situation. Um, this is normally also the point in the presentation where I might say something like, and please understand that at Burns and Levinson, which is a US-based uh, law firm, uh, we are not necessarily licensed to practice in the UK or Europe, but in fact, um, next slide, Bridget, um, that is not the case at all. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first, but also my colleague, um, Chris Carroll, is actually a solicitor in England and Wales and, and has been practicing before the EPO for over a decade. Um, but first, just let me say my name, in case I didn't say it earlier, is Deborah Peckham. I'm a co-chair of the intellectual property group here at Burns and Levinson. Um, my practice uh, is primarily on the soft IP side, so my work is mostly consulting with clients on trademarks, copyrights, privacy issues, uh, licensing, and other transactional work. Um, Chris, my esteemed colleague, is uh, primarily a patent lawyer um, who has been practicing, has been a practicing patent lawyer for over 10 years. Um, and also, as I said, is licensed to practice before the EPO and in, um, in the UK and uh, England and Wales. Um, his practice concentrates on, uh, he's an engineer by, by trade and by background, so his practice focuses mostly on mechanical, electrical, software, communications, and marine technologies. Um, among the many accolades and things I could say about Chris is that he's been lead counsel for opposition and appeal proceedings at the EPO, including arguing at oral proceedings before the exam division, the opposition division, and the boards of appeal. Um, so we're really, uh, I, when we were preparing for this, for this uh, presentation to you all, I quickly decided that I was going to be kind of the Ed McMahon to um, to Chris, who will be the Johnny Carson. I think he's gonna be doing most of the talking and I'll be doing some of the color commentating going forward, but we're really excited to have Chris. Chris also is lead counsel in our London office, but of course, as with everyone these days, he's, he's basically manning his personal office at home and sort of stretching himself between, between the US and, and Europe. Um, so what are we gonna to do today? Um, we wanted to just spend a little bit of time uh, talking about some of the key things you need to know about Brexit. Let me just silence my phone. Um, and the, well, I guess I'll also say just contextually, one of the reasons why we decided to do this was probably like all of you in the last year or so, since the beginning of the transition period for Brexit, we as US practitioners have been um, have just been inundated with uh, very helpful advice from our European agents and friends who have sent us information about what it all means for, um, for this, for Brexit to be coming and what we should be preparing for. Um, but 
sort of at the end of the year, I realized, although I had read many of those pieces, I really needed someone to sit me down and talk to me about it and what I really needed to know. And so I started to talk to Chris about it and we quickly realized, hey, maybe we could do it because Chris, like I said, has um, a, lot, a lot of context in Europe and is uh, very familiar with the laws and regulations. And so we thought, hey, this would be a great thing to do. Um, so we wanted to give people more of a high level overview about what you actually need to know now. So we're gonna just go through really quickly what are the important dates, what's happening with previously, if you own pan-European rights or you owned them before 1231, before the transition period, what should you be, what's happening with those now? What's going on with these things that are referred to as clones? Um, what rights are impacted and which ones aren't because that's important to know. Um, what are the differences that we should be aware of when we're talking to clients in the US in particular between owning a right that was pan-European and had you know, UK potential for enforcement before versus what rights are we getting now in the UK that, um, that are this subject of and a result of these clones. And after kind of understanding that, what then should we be doing to make sure that our filing strategies and our enforcement strategies make sense um, now across all of Europe, including the UK, and then have, have some time then to maybe boil down some key takeaways and strategies for people today. So with that, I think next slide and maybe Chris, why don't you start us off? Okay, thanks Deb and thanks everyone for participating today. Uh, you know, as Deb mentioned, I think this is intended to be sort of a brief presentation to get you thinking about issues with Brexit and, you know, what the effects are on IP rights. So we'll try to run through this quickly and then hopefully we'll get some questions as well. Uh, we'll start out with key Brexit dates. And a lot of you probably know these dates. Uh, the UK actually Brexited, right? Left the European Union on January 31st, 2020. Uh, as a practical matter, they couldn't figure out how to uh, establish a new trading relationship between each other. So they set a transition period, right? Uh, to sort of figure out a final agreement between the parties. Uh, as is typical, they just barely made the deadline, right? And so the transition period ended on December 31st, 2020 uh, with an agreement between the two parties, both claim that they're happy with that. Uh, we'll see how that plays out, right? Uh, with respect to IP rights, uh, you know, there are additional important deadlines, right? So, for example, um, the transition agreement outlined that there's a period of time uh, until the end of September 2021 in which um, pending applications uh, with respect to uh, trademarks and designs, uh, the parties will have to consider filing uh, uh, corresponding trademarks and design applications in the UK and not going to be automatically transferred over or cloned into the UK. So that's an important date. Uh, one other important date is January 1, 2022. And that's a, that's a deadline associated with something you might not be thinking about, but which could be potentially important, which is uh, recording ownership rights or security interests. Uh, at the UK IPO, which may have been done at the EU IPO in the past. Uh, next slide. So what happens now that the transition is over, right? Uh, well, you know, first of all, with respect to registered, right? EU trademarks and uh, community design rights, they've automatically been transferred, they've automatically been cloned over to the UK IPO. I think the uh, UK IPO put out a notice about a week ago indicating that they transferred or recreated um, about 2 million trademark and, and uh, design rights at the UK I, in the UK IPO uh, by 11 p.m. on December 31st. So uh, the good news is that your existing uh, rights have been cloned over. Uh, but what you need to be aware of is that applications, right, that are pending, that were pending at the EU IPO, those are transferred over. So that's something that you have to think about. I mentioned that date, September 30, 
2021 at your deadline. So maybe you need to be thinking about whatever applications you may have had for EU trademarks or community designs um, and figure out whether you need to refile uh, the equivalent in the UK. Now, some rights aren't exactly equivalent between the two entities. So you have this unregistered right, design right in the UK versus an unregistered design right uh, in the European Union. And they're not quite equivalent. Substantively, um, there's a difference in who can actually obtain the right, let's say in the UK. Uh, and so what the UK has done is they've created these additional unregistered design rights. One is called the continuing unregistered design. And another one is called the supplementary unregistered design in the UK. And they're intended to match the unregistered design, community design right in, in the EU, which gives you a three year period of time, right? Of protection from, uh, from when the, uh, the design was first used, let's say, uh, first disclosed in the EU. Uh, and so I'll elaborate, I can elaborate further on those two, um, you know, as we go further in, into this presentation. Uh, you know, we're, go ahead. Yeah, Chris, just to, just because, again, this is me asking the question just to clarify, and maybe maybe this is um, in other people's minds too. But just to clarify, so if you have a pending design right application as of 1231, that's not the equivalent of, not necessarily the equivalent of what you're referring to as this unregistered. So it's, it was Correct. unregistered as of 1231, but there's a distinction between whatever might have been pending as of 1231, which now opens this nine month window for you basically to perfect that in the UK versus what was a recognized unregistered design right under European practice. Yeah, so you're right. So there's a distinction between a registered design right, right, registered community design and an unregistered community design right. Right. Uh, for, some, you know, for, for certain products, uh, you may not want to register because the turnaround so quick, right? Uh, the lifetime is so quick that you might decide just to uh, utilize the unregistered community design right. Uh, and so it, there are instances in which um, you may already have a registered design right and you're not concerned about unregistered community design, but there are instances where, uh, for example, you have an unregistered community design right. Let's say you, you um, introduce product in the EU at some point before the transition, the transition occurs, right? You would still have, let's say, two more years on your unregistered design, right? But there's nothing in the UK, right? Well, what they did is they created this continuing unregistered design, right? Which would essentially give you the, re the additional two years of term in the UK for an equivalent unregistered design, right, in the UK. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there's issues uh, associated with opposition and cancellations associated with trademarks that Deb, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, and, and that could depend on, you know, that those could continue. Uh, I think it depends on the origin of where, right, the, the opposition, uh, the basis for the opposition of cancellation occur. You know, if it's, if it's uh, in the UK, uh, then, you know, that, that procedure will probably be extinguished, right? The EU IPO. Right, right. I kind of think that just, you know, since this point follows on the sort of creation of the clones issue, the sort of important administrative point, I suppose, about opposition and other proceedings that might've been going on as of 1231, is that those generally would continue, but they don't spawn automatically a clone opposition or cancellation proceeding in the UK. And if you have something pending before um, the EU opposition board, then um, if that proceeding before 1231 was based exclusively on a UK right, then those proceedings probably are all, certainly are not gonna be successful. You would have to start over in the UK. Um, so you kind of have to look at whatever is on your docket and, what's, and what has been started and try to figure out if you need to sort of restart proceedings, I think, in the UK, or what the enforcement strategy is going to be going forward if the issue was really ex exclusive or primarily in the UK. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Uh, other intellectual property patents, uh, I'll elaborate further on this, but uh, European patents are covered under a different regime, under the European Patent Convention. It's a different treaty than the Treaty of the European Union. So generally patents, patent enforcement won't change in Europe. Uh, copyrights generally not impacted. Uh, and I'll explain one reason for that as well. And uh, Deb, if you want to elaborate on domain names, but um, I think that that might be useful. Yeah. Um, I'll just add, you know, uh, on the notion of copyrights to the extent in particular we have US people watching. So to me as a, you know, a copyright specialist, copyrights can be, uh, they overlap in terms of what is covered with design rights generally. So, so to the extent your copyright right in the US might also be uh, European design, that's, that's the only way it could be impacted, but otherwise copyrights themselves are not uh, impacted by, by Brexit, um, other than, again, as to an enforcement strategy going forward with respect to the UK. And with domain names, just the, I think the interesting thing here is that um, because the UK was part of the EU the e, uh, before the transition period, then anybody in the UK or any business in the UK could own a .eu domain name. Once that once the UK exited, then UK residents can no longer own a .eu uh, domain name. Um, and that does impact some um, of my clients, just as an example, who are US-based because many of them do have UK um, you know, places of business and headquarters. And so to the extent they were trying to sort of own domain names across the European Union, they do own .eu domain names. Those would have to be transferred to an entity that now is resident in Europe. So it's just something to be thinking about. Do we own any .eu domain names and who can own them? Great. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I just wanted to make this point about IP laws in Europe, right? It's, it's really, it's a mix of various, and the regime is a mix of various uh, regulations and regulatory regimes, right? You have the Treaty of the European Union, uh, you have the European Patent Convention, and you have uh, national laws. And so th they're a mix, but it's, so it, I would call it a layered uh, coexisting uh, layer of existing um, IP regulatory schemes. Uh, I, you know, with respect to patents, as I had mentioned before, they're covered under the European Patent Convention. Now, not all of the European states are members of the European Patent Convention, or you have in the European Patent Convention. The overlap is fairly substantial. I mean, it's just about uh, equivalent, but you have countries such as Switzerland, which are, which are a member of the EPC, but not a member of the EU. And I guess you could say now that's the case for the UK, right? Uh, and you also have, as I said, uh, and so with respect to patents, they're sort of vertically in a different space. Uh, uh, that's they're covered under a different regime than, for example, copyrights, trademarks, and designs, which are under the the Treaty of the European Union regime, right? Uh, and one thing about the I would say, you know I think it's important to note is that the European Union uh, has has a multiple mechanisms for uh, harmonizing IP law. Uh, one is, you know, they can promulgate a regulation uh, and the regulation could create an entity like the European Union IPO office, which could then uh, administer EU-wide IP rights, like EU trademarks and community designs. Uh, but they can also, the European Union will also from time to time um, uh, distribute what are called directives. The directives are instructions to your different European states um, to conform their national laws to a particular maybe IP uh, requirement. And so that happens. And so part of my point here is that in general, the, the, the IP laws throughout the European Union and the UK are, are at this point are, are roughly harmonized, right? Uh, you know, based upon either, you know, many of them are following EPC for patents or they're uh, 
have followed the, um, the European Union uh, rules. Uh, and they've also adopt, you know, har- adapted their IP laws to harmonize things, you know, the copyright laws, the trademark laws, trade secret duty, and so on. Uh, and so at this point, at this stage, you know, even though we've, we've Brexited, the laws are generally harmonized, even now between the UK and EU, but over time, what we'll likely see is a divergence, right? Uh, with the exception of patent law, what you know, so always the UK remains within the EPC. Next slide. Uh, thanks. And I just want to mention one point, which is, uh, you know, Brexit, the, the general convention thought was that the unified patent court, this idea that they would have a centralized enforcement court in Europe, the conventional thinking is that once the, uh, once the UK Brexited and they notified right, the EU that they were withdrawing from the agreement, that it was dead. Uh, but interestingly, there's still some rumbling uh, about potentially Continental Europe going forward, continental Europe going forward with unified patent court. Uh, I think as recently as November, the German Parliament uh, uh, approved ratification of the unified patent court. I mean, that's only two months ago. Uh, now, I think that there were immediately two new constitutional challenges that were submitted, but there's some arguments that they may be late anyway. So, uh, where that's going, uh, it's still unclear, but there's still some there's still some effort, I think, within continental Europe to try to uh, maintain or, or go forward with some form of unified patent form. Next slide. So takeaways. I think me and me and Deb can jump in on this as well. But uh, I, you know, just you know, simple practical things, right? Uh, if you had uh, European trademarks and European, you know, community designs, registered community community designs, you want to take a look and confirm that, you know, they've been cloned in the UK, right? Make sure that that's been uh, carried over into into the UK. Right. Um, you want to be sure that um, you want to you want to be careful about any pending applications that you have in the EU, right? You have a limited time frame now to file equivalent applications in the UK. So, so you know, this is a docket review that you're, you, you want to have with in-house counsel, maybe your, your European counsel and your US counsel, just to make sure you have all those ducks are lined up in a row. Um, and yet going forward, you need to think about your filing strategies, right? For trademarks and designs, filing in both those different jurisdictions. Uh, I had mentioned unregistered Right, design rights, a, that's a little bit tricky now. So you need to be thinking about your strategy because, um, for example, you can obtain an unregistered community design in Europe, right? If that product was first disclosed in Europe, right? But now you have these two entities, you have the UK and you have Europe. So you may have to figure out, you know, in which, in which jurisdiction you want to do that first disclosure. So if you want that unregistered community design right in the EU, you do it, you know, you do it there first. But what you do is then you register. You, you, you actually register your community design in the other jurisdiction. If you want to make sure that you still have protection in both. Or, you know, maybe ideally you just register in both. Um, but that's something to think about, how you deal with that. Um, you want to think about, you know, whether you need to register assignments licenses and security uh, interests in the UK, right? Now that we have moved over a lot of rights into the UK, they've, they've been automatically created for you. Now you should, now you have some, you need to consider whether you need to protect those, um, those rights uh, by recording. Uh, contracts, right? That's very important. You need to look back at any, um, any license agreements and so on to see you know, how they were worded. Uh, whether they were EU specific and whether any amendments have to be uh, applied. Deb, do you have any other takeaways? Yeah, I mean, just I'll pick up a little bit on what you said and, and offer a couple other um, comments. Um, it, just, it seems like, uh, and this isn't a big surprise, but it seems like the key takeaway really is 
um, the obvious one, which is, whereas before in the US, we had to kind of figure out how does Europe figure into our filing strategy and our enforcement strategy and our business strategy around, you know, for instance, with respect to designs, whether to register them or not, and then how are you going to qualify as an unregistered design, you now have basically have to run that analysis in parallel tracks, which I'm sure for Europeans is very, is a very normal way of thinking, but for the US, we were so used to this one-stop shop that inc included the UK, but now we need to um, think of the UK almost from a trademark practitioner standpoint. We, we do this commonly with clients anyway, with respect to other countries that were part of Europe, but aren't part of, weren't part of the European Union anyway. UK is a bigger deal for most Americans just because most Americans think of the UK as a place they really wanna be doing business sooner rather than later. Um, and whether or not that's right or not, that's just kind of the way we think about it. So it is, I mean, I just feel like we need to sort of jump through those hoops now, as you said, in parallel. The other thing I would offer is, and this is just based upon personal experience after January 1, is this idea of making sure you know the clones um, has been a little bit more challenging, at least it's not crazy challenging, but it's a little more challenging than it at first sounds. Um, and just to clarify, those clones were created automatically. They have the same renewal deadlines as the previously registered European right, which is good news because, you know, in theory, if you're worried about docketing these deadlines, you'll at a minimum trip across it when you get to the renewal deadline for the European case, assuming that's not eight years from now and somebody hasn't already decided to pull the plug on the European case. But um, just as an administrative matter, the UK IPO has um, given a new numbering system for all these cases. They, the cases, the numbering system varies based upon whether the European case was a direct European Union filing or whether it was a designation under international filing. There are lead eights and lead nines. I won't bore you with it now, but I will insert it into the slides before we send it, just so you know, and I'll give a link to the UK IPO website that explains exactly how they've redone this numbering system. And then like our docketing team here is busily putting in these records and double checking them. Um, there's, we haven't found a great way to do it automatically. If somebody has a suggestion for how to do that, you really just have to do the work to figure out what these clones are. But um, it is something that you should make sure either you're doing internally or your outside counsel is doing on your behalf. Um, and then I guess just this last bullet, we already talked a little bit about the pending disputes. I mean, I think it's a, it's sort of a business analysis and um, a rights analysis as to whether or not that you, any pending um, proceedings as of 1231 need to be reconstituted in Europe or whether you want to, um, or, or whether the European case can still be maintained depending upon whether that dispute was based upon a UK right exclusively. Um, I think next slide. Yeah, Devin, just I agree you raised a good point too, which is about the numbering. Uh, that, that also applies to community designs in mm -hmm. the version over. So Hague agreement designations and right. standard community designs still use the nine or the eight prefix. Right. Uh, so that's great. Um, All right. Go ahead, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I mean, there we do have a question, but I think um, it actually it does pick up on what we were just talking about. Um, is there any issue with competitors coming in and registering your trademark before you are in the UK? Um, yes, I mean, so I mean, as a general proposition, you would want to make sure that you have a UK registration um, as soon as possible. So if you don't have a clone off of a off of a previous U, EU IPO trademark registration. Uh, and you are doing business in the UK, you would want to make sure you have a UK registration. Um, there may be UK pre-existing registrations, so you would need to do a search to see if there are issues there, if you don't have, you know, the European one to fall back on and create that case. I don't know if that answers the question, but certainly, you know, you don't, as with any filing strategy outside the US or outside of a country that recognizes common law rights, um, I'm a big believer in trying to obtain rights through registration as soon as possible. 
Um, just on, on strategy, I mean, Chris, can you talk a little bit about how the changes might impact filing strategies going forward? Um, well, I think that last question was, you know, a great segue. I mean, it's, you know, um, now that you have this separate entity, I mean, companies need to be thinking about, you know, initial trademark filings now, right? Registered design filings in the UK, as opposed to you know, thinking EU-wide before. Uh, you know, uh, with, res with respect to existing applications, right? Uh, you know, everyone's, we were happy that uh, a lot of these rights have been cloned over too. Uh, but uh, I think it's, you know, there's a change in mindset, right? Maybe your portfolio might double, maybe not, but uh, there has to be more of an emphasis now about if you've always been thinking about Europe, now you need to be thinking about the UK as well, right? And how you address that. Yeah. Uh, Sort of what I said earlier, that it's just, I think we just now have to jump through that analysis for both places. And, and as I had mentioned before, too, you know, this, the, the, you know, the um, one area I think of that takes, that you may want to spend a little more time thinking about as a company is these unregistered design rights. Yep. Uh, because depending on where you first disclose something, if you do it in the UK, at UK first, right, then you, you have the right there. But then you, you want to consider you, you won't be able to get that unregistered right in Europe then, or vice versa. So then you want to be thinking about uh, there is this concept of simultaneous disclosure that uh, a lot of lawyers are talking about that, hey, if I put it on the internet, it's simultaneously disclosed in the UK and in Europe. But that's something that would have to be tested in court. And you probably don't want to be the first one to get the bad result. So I think these, these strategies of, okay, maybe I disclose in one jurisdiction to make sure I've registered design. Right, and I, you, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, you, this is a whole area that I don't necessarily practice in very much, but it seems like this question of whether to go for an unregistered design right um, is, is now more complicated because of the UK situation. So, and that you're really gonna have to sort of really sit down and think through whether or not disclosure is something that's palatable and then where you would do that and then what you would do to make sure you're covered elsewhere. There's a lot that goes, I imagine, that goes into that decision anyway. So now yeah. it's become even further layered, is, I guess is what you're saying. All right, I mean, that's a good, I love, that's a good point. And, uh, you know, with respect to patents, I guess I should mention that, which is, uh, this, you know, as I said, uh, patents are covered under the European Patent Convention, so, you know, you can continue to file European at the EPO, right, and you can validate, you can continue to validate in the UK. Great. Anything else that we haven't touched on? I think we, I think we've hit the high points, but we're certainly happy to take additional questions from our audience members. And if not, um, maybe next slide. <laughs> in case you didn't get enough of our faces on the webinar, here they are on the slides. Um, it's been really great speaking with all of you. If you have other questions, please feel free to send them to us by email. Um, or send them, you know, through our LinkedIn pages or however you want to get a hold of us. They're pretty easy to find, and we'd be happy to entertain those questions or any follow-up you might have. And like I said earlier, we will circulate um, the, the slides. I will insert a little bit more about the numbering system and, so that you can see that in the final set. Um, any, any last comments? Mr. Carroll. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. And... Uh... I learned a lot, so there you go. <laughs> I guess with everything that you don't really learn it really well until you have to teach it. So thank you everyone for giving us this opportunity to sort of try to summarize our understanding of IP rights post transition period and Brexit.